myself. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Peter. We've, uh, I used to be in North London U3A with Peter, and we ran a regional study day a few years ago, but I haven't seen him since. And when Mike talks about people of our age, uh, Peter was just joining secondary school when I, when I got married. And I said that because we were married in 1956 and we had what must have been one of the first credit cards. John Lewis gave you a card, which you paid every month. And we furnished our house on a Thursday evening when John Lewis was open until seven o'clock, which was a little bit before Peter knew them. But uh, Peter worked for John Lewis for 35 years and has written a wonderful book called John Speed and Lewis. And he's also written five other books since he retired. So I'm delighted that we finally got him here. So Peter, over to you. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, I'll, um, I'll start by saying that in the John Lewis partnership that I knew, if anybody wanted to start a new group like a, like a pickleball group, all they had to do was to get enough like-minded people, and it wouldn't need to be very many, and uh, and he'd be able to start it up, and it would be subsidised. So that's the kind of business the partnership was. I trust it's all the same. Anyway, I'm now going to share the screen, so you won't have to look at me, and we're going to have a look at this. Um, I'm going to run this slideshow from the beginning, which is this. Now, this is the cover spread out of the book I wrote. Um, I published it in 2010, which was the 100th anniversary, in fact, the same month, October 2010, of what I call Speed and Lewis's big idea. His big idea was that it was much better to run a business if you could give all the employees a stake in it and could share um, what he called um, gain, knowledge, and power. And I'll explain to you how he did that. But first, I'm going to start with the headline I put up uh, when I last did this presentation, which is in February 2020, to a different U3A, which was before we ever knew about anything called the pandemic. And retailing was at that stage suffering. Um, these are some headlines. The first four are headlines, actually. John Lewis is considering axing its staff bonus this year after seeing its profit slide. In fact, it didn't ax the bonus, but it did this year. Marks and Spencer's reported another quarter of fa falling food and clothing sales. And next, Amazon has confirmed it pays UK business rates of only 63.4 million, almost 40 million less than next, despite having more than double its sales. And this, in a nutshell, uh, describes the ailment of major retailers in, 20, in the second half of the 2010s. Amazon, it then says, halved its UK corporation tax bill in 2017, despite its profits tripling. How could that come about? Well, we know how that came about uh, because they can, uh, they can wangle their way through all rules. And in fact, if I buy anything from Amazon, and if you do too, it seems to be coming from Luxembourg, or at least I'm paying for it in Luxembourg, which has extremely lax tax rates. In October 2018, I was triggered by a report from the Royal Society of Public Health, which is my penultimate line there, uh, entitled Running on Empty, which we looked at the high street um, in the UK three years after it had f first done so. And that prompted me to go around my local streets in East Finchley, Muswell Hill, North Finchley, and have a look at them. And de I decided that I would pose to the U3A a high street study. I proposed it in May of 2019, but there was a lot of delay and dithering until suddenly in, on the 14th of July, 2020, um, the first live Zoom I'd ever did um, required asked to do so by Catherine Ware for the um, for the London Regional uh, summer summer school. It attracted something like two hundred and seventy people, and before I knew it, I'd said, "Right, let's start a project now, and let's do it very fast," which is what we did. Uh, we got going, um, and I went from working 
zero hours a day to 16 hours a day for two months, at the end of which time my heart said, that's my physical heart, not my metaphorical heart, my physical heart said, you've got to stop this, you're working too hard. So I stopped having kicked the project off and since, since September 2020, it's been run by a lady called Michaela Moody from Lincolnshire. And that um, illustrates one of the benefits of the pandemic for the U3A. I know it's been ghastly for most of you and for most of us, but it did mean that I could start running um, uh, management groups in the U3A straight away and pick people who were all over the country. They didn't have to come to London to be part of the group, which is one of the reasons we were able to get it going so fast. Um, and uh, I, I don't know what the latest position is. I haven't been following it, but I, I, know that, I know that Neil has been taking part in that, and I'm sure that there will be more to come on that. We were due to report in 2022, which is the 40th anniversary of, of uh, the UK U3A. So I'm looking forward to reading that report. Right, back to John Lewis. Now, you all I would imagine know about the John Lewis partnership bonus, the fact that uh, the bonus is distributed, profits are distributed to its employees in a ratio approximately, well, it was always described to me as about a 50-50 ratio, 50% 50 of the profit was plowed back into the business and 50% was distributed to all the employees, very soon known as partners, as we all were, as they all are now, in proportion to their salary. So it wasn't just a bonus for the top uh, 1%, but a bonus for everybody, admittedly, uh, in proportion to salary. It's something that I wasn't particularly happy about at the time, um, but there's probably no better way of doing it. Anyway, just to look at that for a moment, um, the partnership itself started in Peter Jones, as I'll describe in 1920. And between then and the First World, Second World War, the average bonus every year was 10%. Then for reasons that I'll describe, it took 20 years to recover uh, from the war and the average bonus was 2%. Then when I was there, this is entirely coincidental, of course, uh, the bonus average was about 16, 17%. But as you can see what happened, the internet really started um, taking an interest in retail at the turn of the millennium um, when I stayed up on Millennium Eve to make sure everything went okay. And for those of you who think that there was nothing that could have gone wrong, nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is we managed it well. And I got fed up with people in the next year, say, in the following year saying, what on earth was all the fuss about? Anyway. Um, in 2013, the bonus was 17%. This is about this point, the uh, percentage of retail taken by the internet had crept up from zero at about the year 2000 to about 13%. And every year since then, it went up by a further 1%. And the consequence effect, consequential effect on John Lewis is marked, even though John Lewis is a very early adopter of the internet, uh, as I'll describe later. So when it came to February 2019 and those headline reports, was there going to be a bonus at all? Well, there was. It was 3%. And that's the last one there's been. Now the pandemic hit. So the top line here says that essentially every year, the percentage of retail trade taken by the internet increased by 1%. So it got up to 21% by 2019. But last year, it went up shot up to 31%, more than a third extra of the trade for, 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 for quite clear reasons, went to the internet. And part of the problem was that a whole number of people who had never used the internet before for, home, for, for shopping felt that they could do and felt obliged to do as well. Meanwhile, the uh, Instigator and owner of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, increased his wealth, continued to increase his wealth by over $2,500 each second. And as you can see from the image, that's where a lot of it went. That's where a lot of our tax might have gone. Now, what would he have thought of it? This is John Lewis, the original John Lewis, not the man who started the partnership, that was his son. 
uh, but the man, man he named the partnership after, his father, John Lewis, who was born in 1836, so he's born before Victoria came to the throne uh, and was orphaned at the age of seven. He was parceled up and sent various places and started as a, um, uh, in a, uh, a department store, uh, well, not a department store, a drapers, I should say, department stores barely existed at that point. At the age of 14, he was brought up in Somerset um, and he went to several stores and eventually came back to came to London for having been sacked from his last job in Liverpool for fighting and worked for Peter Robinson on the west side of Ox east side of Oxford Circus Station. And in 1864, the second block on the right of that of the, of the um, uh, map, map at the bottom and the little black blob uh, at the corner of Oxford Street and Horace Street at the top, he opened a single shop at 132 Oxford Street. He took over a confectioner's, scraped all the plaster off the walls to make it as wide as he possibly could. Because if you see an illustration of people shopping at that time, all the ladies had skirts that extended to about six foot wingspan. <clears throat> so not many could get in at once. He wanted as much room for, for um, customers and as much room for stock. On the first day, his takings were 18 shillings and fourpence. For those of you, and I expect all but very few remember what life was like before decimalization. And for those of us here in computing, we remember the date 19th of February 1971, because it was extraordinarily complicated to convert really badly written computer programs from, from uh, pound shillings and pence to decimal. But fortunately, we did. Now, like many, uh, entrepreneurs who all, all started as drapers, in his case, as what was called a silk mercer. They gradually built up their trade by buying next door shops, if they were successful. And he, although he was, he was much more conservative uh, than many of his other uh, de department store owners, like uh, Peter Jones in Sloan Square, like Jones Brothers in Islington, and like the Bon Marche in uh, Brixton, perhaps in Streatham, uh, a near, nearer one to you. He was, uh, he, would, he, he didn't, it took it until 1892 until he finally got the corner shop, he could knock them all together. And three years later, he rebuilt them. And he rebuilt them as this building on the left. You can see John Lewis and company on the left. This, this is from the 1890s. There's nothing, everything is horse drawn here. Um, and that is Oxford Street as it was then. And that's what he looked like at that point. He turned into an Old Testament prophet by the look of it. He spent um, 30 years working hard uh, and wasn't, it wasn't until he was 48 that he married. He regarded himself and all his friends regarded him, so I regarded him as a lifelong bachelor. And he was until he met th this young lady or at least three years after he met her. He met her, first of all, on a rarely taken holiday on the Caledonian Canal in Scotland, where she went with her brother, who was a, um, who was a department store owner. She herself had been orphaned uh, in, in single figures, uh, but she had prospered by becoming one of the first women to graduate, and that word graduate is in quotes, to graduate from Girton College, Cambridge. Her name was Eliza Baker, um, and she was 31 when they married. Three years after they first met, John Lewis got on a, the top of an omnibus in Oxford Street and sat down next to her, and she turned to him and said, good morning, Mr. Lewis, and he turned and said to her and said, and said do I know you? A fortnight later, he proposed to her. So John Lewis is used to making rapid decisions, and uh, they had a fruitful marriage, shall we say? He, she produced for him. Oh, I should say that she was the deputy head of a girls' school in Bedford, um, and presumably hadn't imagined marriage at all, but there it came along, and she produced two sons, and before very long, they were living in this handsome house at the top of Hampstead Heath. No longer there, demolished, I'm afraid. But it meant that, this young man 
John Speeden Lewis, always known as Speeden, S-P-E-D-A-N, uh, and his younger brother Oswald, who were born 18 months apart, uh, the heir and the spare, uh, were able to uh, play on Hampstead Heath. In fact, as a consequence, Speeden became a very, very, uh, a very, very noted naturalist and spent a lot of his time and money, um, the money he didn't give away, on, on, um, on wildlife. Um, now, he was all ready to go to Oxford, as his brother was, but uh, by, this, by this time, his father was 70, and Speeton's mother was worried that he was going to do something silly, give the business away, give it up, and persuaded Speeton to join him in the business for a couple of years. And Speeton joined him in the business for a couple of years and stayed there for the rest of his life until he was 70. Now, they didn't get on terribly well because the old man was intransigent, Sweden said he'd always regarded his father as being superb at the retail trade because he'd been successful. But as soon as he got there, he realized his father wasn't. He had great principles, but they weren't well um, and carried through, maintained, and his oversight was pretty poor. And Sweden was a very bright young man. Still, it wasn't until 1906 that John Lewis bought another shop. He had a single shop in Oxford Street from 1864 to 1906, and then was persuaded to buy this shop, which uh, some of you will guess is actually Peter Jones in Sloan Square. Not the current Peter Jones, the Peter Jones that was there about this time, which is probably about 1910. Judging by the dress of the three little girls wearing uh, straw hats. I always wonder what happened to those three little girls. Um, on the building up to the right, which is part of the Peter Jones department store, you can see vaguely a star. And that was a pub called the Star. And when John Lewis took it over by walking over to Sloan Square with a, a banker's draft of 22,500 pounds in his pocket, and bought it from uh, the, the, the two sons of Peter Jones himself, who died about five years before, and it was, were letting the business go to rack and ruin. That pub was part of the business. And in fact, it was the most profitable department in the business in 1909, as Speedon said rather ruefully to the shareholders. Um, Speedon was installed in Peter Jones by his father rather reluctantly. Speedon was not allowed to do anything important in John Lewis, but he pleaded with his father to get, let him go to Peter Jones and, and run it because his father really wasn't very good at running another department store. He only knew Oxford Street. And it was about this time, in fact, in uh, 1909, that Speedon was uh, going to work on his horse, as he always did, down from Hampstead Heath, down, down through Hampstead Heath, Regent's Park, to Oxford Street and the stables at the back of, and the mews at the back, of Weymouth Mews, when his horse shied at something and threw it. Speedon fetched up that day, uh, worked that day and then collapsed later on because a, 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 lung, a rib had punctured his lung and he was off with something pretty nasty um, for the best part of two years and was lucky to survive actually. But while he was, Recuperating, he saw his father's uh, books for Oxford Street, John Lewis Oxford Street shop for the first time. He was horrified to, to discover. Um, I'll, I'll put that one up. We'll have a change. And you can um, wonder what that's all about. He discovered that the employees at Oxford Street, of, of whom there were 300, were, uh, were taking home in total 30,000 uh, pounds. Correction, correction, 16,000 pounds. So they're earning round about a pound a week, um, about, just about 50 pounds a year, uh, which is interesting is what some of you will know, round about a pound a week was the title of a book published in 1909 by a woman called Maud Pamber Reeves, Fabian Society, describing how difficult it was to get for anybody to get by on 50 pounds a week. 
for the equivalent, uh, uh, sorry, 50 pounds a year, one pound a week. Um, uh, we've not learned a lot, I don't think. Anyway, uh, Speedon realized that he and his father and his brother were taking out in total exactly the same as these 300 employees. So the ratio of their income to his was one in a hundred and that horrified him. And he set himself to, to figure out if there was a better way of running things. And that's what he decided ultimately to do. And in 1910, he realized how he could do it. Then very soon after the war came, he wasn't able to, to bring his ideas to practice because his father wouldn't let him essentially. But at the outbreak of World War I, his father said, all right, you take it over on your own. I'll, I'll back out as long as you work in John Lewis Oxford Street for, from nine to five. So at five o'clock, Speedon would hop into a taxi, go to Peter Jones and work there and work his way through it. And part of the things, one of the things he did was to say these hostel, the, the rooms in the hostel above Peter Jones are absolutely appalling. Most department stores and a lot of um, grocers stores had hostels for the unmarried employees, men and women, had separate hostels for men and women. And in Peter Jones, they were above the shop. He decided they were appalling and he immediately altered them. He gutted them and he gave the uh, employees the opportunity to decide what the furnishing should be. And they were completely poleaxed at this. And it was an indication of his attitude to the people who worked in the business. He, he said at one point that nobody who runs a business that is profitable should pay any of these employees less than, quote, a decent living wage, an expression which has been re-emerged many years later. At the end of the war, just before the end of the war, he started a weekly magazine for Peter Jones. He called it the Gazette, and that weekly magazine is still going today. I like the way he writes it. He says, to my fellow employees of Peter Jones Limited, ladies and gentlemen, he doesn't say to the staff. And this was the forerunner of a magazine which, which within a year had got an anonymous letter column. He decided the best way to find out what was really going on in his shop was to allow people to complain. Um, they were, people were a bit timid at first, but eventually they did, helped by him who, wrote, who would write letters to himself over a pseudonym and then reply at length. And eventually they were persuaded it was a good plan. And that, that was one of the ways he shared knowledge. And he expressed it as gained knowledge and power. And the first bonus, here's the rough working for the first bonus, came in 1920-21. It came in the form of non-voting shares. He worked out a method of doing it uh, so that the employees could have a stake in the business, but they wouldn't have so much power that they could actually sell it, which had happened, actually, in America on a couple of occasions. Immediately after the war, uh, there was a strike across the whole of retail. What happened was that uh, ha there having been virtually no inflation, this is hard to imagine, virtually no inflation in Britain between the end of the Napoleonic War in 1815 and the start of World War I in 1914, the value of the pound dropped by a factor of two. So if you were being paid a pound a week in 1914, it was worth 10 bob, 50 shillings, uh, uh, 50 pence at the end of the war. So there was, there was a strike by the poorly organized um, shop workers union and only one major retailer stood out against it. Speed and Lewis, uh, John Lewis, sorry, get it right. Old John Lewis, still running John Lewis in Oxford Street at the age of 82, uh, flanked in this um, photograph from um, a, a newspaper at the time by two of the strikers. The newspaper uh, deliberately placed them like that to get, to get their point across, that the strike was justified and the, the 
uh, intransigent old bugger, John Lewis, who was running the business and, re and refusing to uh, increase pay, was to blame. And that newspaper was called the Daily Mail as a matter of interest. Not quite the same today. Now, Speedon and his brother Oswald and had barely spoken to their father for the best part of 15 years. Um, and it wasn't until that for, for various uh, family reasons, uh, they, they didn't see eye to eye. They argued whenever they spoke. And in the end, they decided they weren't going to bother with him. He would go on running Oxford Street. The younger brother, Oswald, both Oswald and Speedon had been given a quarter interest in John Lewis uh, when they reached the age of 21. Uh, Speedon sold Oswald out and he went to become a, a lawyer and then a conservative MP. And Speedon, like his father, married late in the late 20s, uh, mid 20s. Um, one of the female graduates he recruited from Oxford, he recruited five female and five male graduates who all have got firsts, which is very unusual for retail in those days. But, he, but he, he recognized that he needed bright people around him to challenge him because he didn't really rate the brains of the people who were in the business that he was running. And there was a, uh, a meeting of minds. Eventually, uh, Speedon uh, went to John Lewis and said, I've got married uh, and I don't think he even knew. And this is my boy. And they were, uh, uh, they, they were um, reconciled. And Speedens actually, Speedens needed money to expand Peter Jones. And he persuaded his father to come over to Peter Jones and have a look. He'd never actually been to see it for the past 15 years. Uh, John Lewis was impressed, pumped money into the business, and uh, a very rocky period for uh, Peter Jones was overcome at that point. That's what Peter Jones looked like uh, in the late 20s. And it had been, when uh, Speedon first went there, it, it, it had been a business planted in an extremely rich area, Belgravia, uh, and the area around Sloan Square. But it was not selling to the well-off people in Belgravia. It was selling to their maids, their servants, their cooks, their gardens. And it was relentlessly down market. And Sweden dragged it up market with a series of adverts like this. And by, by recruiting some interesting people to be buyers who had no retail experience at all. Some of them were ter terrible flops and he got rid of them. Some of them were very successful. And he was one of them. He was an extremely successful buyer himself. And this is an early advert to try and show the Peter Jones lifestyle. And that's been the image that Peter Jones has had ever since. And that's Peter Jones now. Uh, Speedon, Speedon hated department stores that were essentially masonry with windows stuck in. He wanted essentially a building full of windows because he wanted air and he wanted light. And he commissioned this man who, who at the time was the prize student at, um, at Manchester University, the prize architecture student and said, I want you to build me something made of glass. And essentially he did uh, put this um, very romantic curve on it. And that's the building that we see in uh, Sloan Square today. And that was the parent store in 1937, decked out for the coronation of George VI, a bustling Oxford Street. And this is the business they bought in the same year. This is Waitrose in Acton in 1910 with the, uh, with the, the employees outside, uh, a single woman, which is unusual. Uh, grocery business is all men and had a pretty poor reputation actually. But, I always liked the we save you money on top. Because when I grew up, when I, when I was in the business, Waitrose didn't exactly save you money uh, and doesn't exactly. It makes you eat better, perhaps, but it doesn't exactly save you money. 
Anyway, this was the man who started Waitrose. Um, he was the half of the pair that started Waitrose. His name was Wallace Waite. And he started Waitrose with his partner, Arthur Rose, in 1904, when he himself was 28. And interestingly, he'd been brought up in Shepton Mallet, exactly the same place that old John Lewis had 50 years earlier. He wanted to be a farmer. His father was a railway engineer um, and had seven sons. He was the seventh. And his father decided what each of them was going to do. So this, despite the fact that Wallace wanted to be a farmer, at the age of 12 years and one day, he was sent to Pontypool to be apprenticed to a grocer. He hated it to start with, and you probably hated it too, if you were paid in the first year, nothing. In the second year, five pounds. In the third year, 10 pounds in total. He managed to save about half of that, sleeping above the shop. Um, and he used to go back every uh, Saturday after closing the shop, back to Shepton Mallet on the train to meet his girlfriend, who he eventually married. Uh, and then it, as soon as he could, he came to London uh, and started his own business with his mate, Arthur Rose. Rose went very quickly afterwards. Rose went to the war and came back shell-shocked. Um, but Wallace Waite profited and had, by 1937, he got 10 stores and had moved the sh shops up market. This was the Waitrose in Gerard's Cross with its fleet of delivery vehicles. When I joined Waitrose, they didn't do any deliveries at all. So, so that, that was a, a, a real anachronism until we started home shopping in about in the 1990s, late 1995, 96, which was uh, uh, amusing. And that's what Waitrose Gerard's Cross looked like in 1937. Tins, tins everywhere, um, somewhere for, for Madame to sit down uh, and an assistant talking to her with a, a pencil uh, behind his ear as every shop assistant would, ha would have had in those days, taking down her order for delivery. And Waitrose advertised. Waitrose never advertised in my time until very late on. And this is, uh, this is somebody who is clearly enjoying her raisin stoner. That look on her face. There she is. And here we are back at John Rose on Oxford Street in 1937. And I want to show you the same picture from the same place from a different angle in on the 19th of September, 1940. When, uh, despite all Sweden's best efforts at sealing the building for, against bombs and fire, um, three bombs had a direct hit on the roof on that date when there was a strong west wind blowing and it blew the fire across. This is Hollis Street across the center. And it blew the fire across from the left, the west, to the east, this is the block, which is no longer John Ose's, between Hollis Street and Oxford Circus. Uh, and that's where the, the jets are now being trained, and they're having virtually given up on the left. So it was left a ruin. They could do about 10% of the trade, and that was the great motor. What Speed had done in the 30s was bought another half dozen shops to spread the risk, including Waitrose. Uh, the other shop, of the other shops, unfortunately, three were on the coast and they all got bombed. So that wasn't particularly far-sighted far, far of him because Hitler started by bombing airfields and, and coastal installations uh, and only switched to London after August 1940 when a lone bombing raid got through to Berlin uh, and he was outraged, Goering had, had sworn to him that uh, English bombers would never get through, but they did. And Hitler, in a rage, ordered a switch of tactics to bomb cities, which turned out to be a very, very bad mistake, not least for the people who lived in the cities, but certainly for, for the German war effort. And that's the devastation afterwards. And here they are taking people's 
names down who had accounts to pay. What Speedon had done is had a separate set of accounts. So one set of accounts was in the building and had burnt down, but he had, they had a second set copied every day and sent to his home in the Test Valley in Hampshire near Stockbridge, which is now, in fact, he had two homes. One is called Longstock House, the other was Lecton Abbas, and both are now holiday homes in the partnership. He had also bought a country club, which he, he made available to everybody at Cookham in Berkshire on the Thames in 1928-29, uh, which is still there to this day. And it took from 1940 to 1960 to fully rebuild John Ray Oxford Street, and they could not start rebuilding until 1955, because all the steel uh, was used for rebuilding industry. Uh, it was not popular with either the Tories or Labour. The Labour, because the partnership did not, did, it said its employees could form unions, but they didn't need to because they were being paid better than other shop assistants were. And the Tories didn't like them because they weren't quoted on the stock exchange. They had very little leverage. So it wasn't until 1955 they started to rebuild. At the back is a hangar, an aircraft hangar that was used as a temporary sales space. So if you went to John Lewis, he went, actually went to John Lewis in the year Maggie was married, he went to Joyce, John Lewis in Oxford Street, you would not have found uh, a, a department store at all. You'd have found something like that. And I like this. I really like this photograph once I found it. It's a man with a barrow and a man with a plan. Upstairs, downstairs in the building tray. And there is John Lewis Oxford Street, rebuilt in 1960, showing the sculpture of winged, so called winged figure, which was being commissioned by Speed and Lewis' successor as chairman, a man called Sir Bernard Miller. Um, a piece of public art, a bit of a rarity these days, but this is, this, this is what he had created for him by this woman, Barbara Hepworth in St. Ives, and that shows you the size of it. I don't know if anybody have noticed, any of you have noticed it on the side of John Lewis Oxford Street. It, it's supposed to be emblematic of the conjunction between capital and labor expressed in the way the partnership runs itself. And that was 1960. And there just shows what the hit of that bombing in Oxford Street gave the partnership in 1940. It took 20 years to get a bonus up and running again. When I joined in 1968, 1st of January 1968, Monday, not a public holiday, as it wasn't then, um, the first bonus was 9% and it gradually worked its way up. So that at its maximum, it was 24%, which seems an extraordinarily high figure. And we thought so at the time, we thought more money I say we, we and the people, people like me, wanted more money ploughed back into the business. But the business remained extremely conservative for a long period of time until round about the year 2000. No advertising until the 1990s whatsoever. For very good reasons. Uh, Lord Leverhulme would say, uh, who, who ran Lever and Brothers uh, at, at, and sold things like Purcell and Tide, would say that I, uh, my advertising is absolutely essential. And it's very expensive. And I know that 50% is successful and 50% is a complete waste of money. Trouble is, I don't know which 50% is which. But eventually, John Lewis decided it would reluctantly follow Waitrose. And, and before very long, it had this uh, extraordinary, after my time, Christmas advert, which would cost huge sums of money, but would also give John Lewis a lot of kudos. Until last Christmas, when they decided it was too much under the latest chairman, who we'll meet later on. Meanwhile, here was Waitrose doing little more than 4% of John Lewis's trade. And on many occasions in the 40s and 50s, they thought of selling it because it wasn't profitable. But one particular finance director, a part-time finance director, persuaded them that it was best to have 
another, another string to their bow, just in case things went wrong. Uh, but if we're going to do something with it, we we better do, we better just we better change it because it wasn't making enough money. This is a classic grocer's shop that you would have you and I would have gone into when we were small. Um, with and this is an early waitress with a with its kiosk at the back. You know, and you paid you paid your money at the back. And there is one just like it uh, a mile away from me now in Muzzle Hill, which opened in 1904 and has still got the mahogany furnishings. Uh, that were that were that installed within that, a year of 1904, but there are very few like that. Now, what happened was um, the supermarket, and the super. The, curiously enough, it's hard to credit, but the first self-service grocery shop supermarket in Britain. Was a, was a Waitrose in 1957 in Streatham. I didn't know that either. Anyway, before very long, uh, this was the bee's knees. This is Waitrose in Slough. I'm not showing it to you in color because the colors clash so much. Uh, Waitrose hadn't exactly got a house style by then and it got a mixture of food and non-food and that's what the first self-service grocers looked like ghastly but it didn't take long uh, to change and although waitrose was a, a, a was much slower than some of the others at expanding it certainly got its act together in terms of design and how it organized itself so for example that is the waitrose that was built a, a, you, you can probably guess where it is that's the waitrose in bath that was built of the right stone and made to look right and that's one of the early cheese counters that were put in in the 1990s, which was very quick to put in self-service counters and other supermarkets followed. Now, I'm, I'm passing quickly up to the present day. This is an initiative Waitrose undertook, started about 20 years ago, to encourage its suppliers in Africa, uh, South Africa in particular, but also Kenya, uh, and some of the other uh, further, more African countries now, like Botswana, to start cooperatives who uh, Waitrose would buy from. And this is this is one in Ghana, actually, I think, pineapples in Ghana. And Waitrose started advertising. Would you believe this is advertising South African wines soon after um, the end of apartheid? Um, uh, it's a still from a television advert. And as, when I was in Wetchers uh, for, the, for the first 20 years, they wouldn't dream of advertising. But the, but the world changed. Waitrose got into big trouble in the early 90s when, if you remember, Sunday trading was made legal. Before that time, it was illegal, but Waitrose's big competitors, notably Tesco and Sainsbury's, were opening on a Sunday and they were, weren't prosecuted. So although John Lewis tried to combine with the Keep Sunday special campaign to defeat it, it, it came in and Waitrose reluctantly started and John Lewis even more reluctantly started later. I don't know if you remember if you were shop, shopping in John Lewis, but if you were outside the center of London, your wait, John Lewis would be open Tuesday to Saturday, closed on Sunday, closed on Monday. Very, very efficient to run a business like that, but you missed a lot of trade if other shops were open on those days. And this was, the kind of thing that you could get on the internet very early on. Of course, now internet shopping for food and non-food is, is uh, commonplace, but it wasn't when it started in the 1990s and early 2000s. And none of us ever thought that you could sell fashion online. And John Lewis was not particularly well known for selling fashion, but, but there it is, it managed it and moved extremely fast. Not, however, that it, that it uh, anticipated the arrival of, uh, it, we used to call it um, bricks and clicks. You had a shop and you had an internet presence. And it, it wasn't expected that a business would arrive that was clicks only and would lose millions and millions of pounds in its first 10 years before it ever made a profit. But it didn't matter 
if it's bankrolled by very, very rich uh, investment companies, which is what happened to Amazon. So, which is now why Bezos is earning $2,500 a second, his wealth is increasing by that much. That was the last but one major department store was built, um, John Lewis Cardiff in 2009, by which time it was beginning to be clear that uh, big department stores were out of date. Uh, not least because they, cut, they took an enormous amount of time to build and uh, their, their payback would be immense, but it would take at least 10 years for any payback. So Jono stopped and thought. Meanwhile, uh, I'm just going to show you this because that's the most important part of, of the John Lewis philosophy. Its retaining philosophy is, has always been these four things. Vash, we called it value, assortment, service, and honesty. Value, expressed in never only undersold. Assortment, assortment width. Old John Lewis used to say, you know, if you can't buy a ribbon of the, the right color in John Lewis, you'll never get it anywhere else. We'll have every single color, including many shades of black, which is what you needed in Victorian England for the, for the morning come on. Our service is going to be exemplary. People will want to go to John Lewis because they'll be looked after properly, and that has remained. And the fifth, fourth one was honesty, because um, John Lewis, before anybody else, before actually the law changed, would, would refuse to say, for example, that something was marked down from 25 pounds to 20 pounds in sale, if it wasn't. Uh, and a lot of the competitors did so, they cheated. And that, those trading principles have been carried through to the present day. Coupled with the co-ownership, the sharing of knowledge, gain and power, um, the, the Gazette and the trading figures, the trading figures, uh, one of the things Sweden did right at the beginning was to publish the trading figures every week, um, to everybody in the business uh, and, the, and the, the department managers and buyers were horrified at the outset, uh, but they soon came around. They didn't like everybody to know that they were losing money, but, it, but Speedin uh, made it work. The annual bonus, and I must put etc. there because I still get, as a retired partner, I still get discount in department stores and in waitros, less in waitros, and I have something that Speedon introduced in 1941, the depths of the war, when the partnership was in big trouble, he said, I know what we'll do, we'll start a pension. So he started an occupational pension long before anybody else. He'd already got, long before beverage, he had a health service, he had a, 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 a doctor and a nurse available in every department store from 1929 onwards. And that remains today. Um, he had staff councils from a very early, early age, uh, individual council in the department store and a council uh, for the whole business, the whole of Waitrose and the whole of the department store, separate ones. And, the, and in 1946, he decided that half of the board should be elected by members of the partnership through the council. So you have a situation, when I left, you had a situation, we had a chairman, deputy chairman, five principal directors and five elected board members who could be and often were shop assistants. The, the accountability I mentioned includes this anonymous letter column. And the point about that letter column is that everybody who is addressed by an anonymous letter, somebody, say somebody's complaining about an office move or what they've done with a particular department, everybody is obliged to answer that letter within three weeks. Otherwise, the chairman would be down on you like a ton of bricks. The consequence of that is that because that was a, a very unpleasant experience for a manager or a director, he would make sure that there was a proper consultation before he ever did something like that. So it encouraged the kind of community of, of, of employees known as partners uh, right from the beginning. And finally, the sense of community was encouraged by not just pensions, and I still have a final, they still have a final salary pension, which is extremely rare these days. You have to qualify, take five years to qualify, but in the old days, you qualified uh, immediately. Societies like the, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the whatever, that, <laughs> whatever that strange new game is, um, 
a dramatic society I was I was um, president of. Uh, we acted uh, we acted in major plays two or three times a year, and hotels um, like that one, which is on Brown Sea Island, which is shared between Dorset Wildlife Trust and John Lewis Partnership. That's that was a, um, a castle originally built by Henry VIII in the 16th century, but was pretty nearly a, a, a ruin when uh, Sweden's successor bought it in 1962. And that's, that allows employees, shop assistants to have a holiday every year for about a quarter of the market rate. Uh, so you could go there for 50 pounds a night, full board. Uh, that's that's the current rate, which is pretty extraordinary. That is a part, partnership council in session, break in a breakout session. The council meets six times a year, and the the management of the business reports back. And this is the kind of consultation that takes place. A partnership board, as I said, chairman, deputy chairman, five directors, five elected and two non-execs. This, this woman what is one of the, was one of the elected members when I retired. She had started as a shop assistant in Waitrose while she was doing her A-levels, um, was called on to run the checkout line when checkout manager was on holiday, decided she liked it, didn't go to university, um, what, went into personnel management and was elected to the board. So that's the kind of person you would get on the board. And don't think they were just ciphers either. Um, the chairman would always make very, very sure that the elected members had their say and also understood everything that was coming to the board. Nothing was, nothing was opaque. Now, let's go back to the present day, 2020, February 2020. Um, John Lewis ran the, the business called John Lewis, although it wasn't a partnership, for 64 years until he died at the age of 92. He, he ran the business in John Lewis in Oxford Street until 1928 when he died, although Speedon was running, essentially running it in the past, in the previous three years. And in fact, he had two, two sets of books made up, one with the actual pay that the shoppers were getting and one with what his father thought they were getting, which was a lot less. He didn't want to upset the old man. So you can see they're all long lived. Uh, they're all appointed by their predecessor. There's no election takes place. And they're all, they've all been in the business for some length of time. And here's some of them, there's Speedon himself, um, looking down his aquiline nose at us. That's the fourth, Stuart Hampson, uh, who went on to run Crown Estates. And he was a civil servant beforehand, uh, a career civil servant, came into the business at about the age of 35. That's Charlie Mayfield, who was the Sir Charlie Mayfield, the chairman when I retired. Um, he's the first person I ever worked for who was younger than me, and he was 20 years younger than me, which is a bit startling. And who would be the sixth chairman? There were three real candidates. Um, Andy Street on the left, who joined straight from university and ran department stores. Mark Price on, on the right, who labeled himself the chubby grocer on the internet, who too, who too joined straight from university and joined John Lewis rather than Mark Suspensers when it, he discovered that they had two golf courses and he had a golfing handicap of two. And also that they, were, they had a shop in Southampton. And he's decided to go to John Lewis because he'd done an archaeology degree and he could, in his first year, dive on the Mary Rose in his spare time. Because that's the time the Red Mary Rose. That's what got him into the business. Both of them stayed from being graduate trainees all the way through into their, into their 50s. When they were passed over for the chairmanship, uh, Mark Price left, was knighted. Andy Street became the Conservative, with a small c, mayor of uh, Birmingham, his hometown. And I'm pleased to say he's not an aficionado of the current prime minister. 
And the third candidate was Patrick Lewis, who's actually the great grandson of old John Lewis, um, uh, the nephew uh, of, of Sweden, a great nephew of Sweden, who, who was a lovely man. All three of them were, were, were great people to work for and with. Um, and Patrick Lewis, I must point out, like his father, had no, uh, no greater um, investment in the business than anybody else. He was just an ordinary, just very, very capable. The question was, who would be the sixth chairman? And uh, this was the answer. Something of a change. Uh, her name's Sharon White. Uh, she was 52 when she was appointed. And as you can see there, she, her parents came from Jamaica. She went to a girls comprehensive and then went to Cambridge. Uh, and she met her husband in Washington. She became a civil servant. She was a permanent secretary to the treasury and then the head of Ofcom. Her husband was until last year, the chairman of the Office of Budget Responsibility and they were known as Mr. and Mrs. Treasury. Uh, and so she came with no retail experience, which caused a number of eyebrows to be raised, um, certainly amongst my former colleagues, though my eyebrows were not raised. Um, but she had enormous uh, financial acumen and knew what she was, she knew what she was talking about. And what she needed to talk about was how the business was going to navigate itself through the next period, because she was appointed in February 2020. And a month later, the pandemic began. And that was the effect. 2020, no bonus. 2021 will be none. 2022, it's possible. I've just been reading the John Lewis website and got myself up to date with what's going on. Um, this is the performance in 2020. The trading profit before tax went up, thanks to two things. One, one Waitrose being increasingly successful, went up from 70 million to 131, but John Lewis itself lost huge sums of money because uh, it, was, wasn't trading for four months of the year. It was buttressed by 191 million from the furlough scheme, uh, which was one of the best things the government's done. But there was in fact a net loss before tax on the balance sheet of over 500 million, over half a billion. And that is because all the high street shops that the partnership owned halved in value in a year and every other business uh, with, with retail premises, major, major business with large retail premises had the same problem. Uh, it took the drastic action of closing 16 unprofitable John Lewis stores. Only six of them were full size. The rest were, there was a, cro a, a home in Croydon, a so-called John Lewis home in Croydon, which is much smaller. And those were unprofitable. In fact, the six full size ones had been unprofitable for many years, but the partnership kept them going because of the um, implicit contradiction of running a business which is owned by its employees and yet making them redundant, which is very difficult to do. So it, prepared, it was prepared to carry those stores in places like Sheffield and Aberdeen and Watford. Um, as it were, as a public service. So my 93 year old aunt is extremely angry that what John Lewis has closed in Sheffield as well she might be. But Sheffield was decimated by the arrival of the, uh, the huge out of town shopping centre, whose name I can't remember at the moment, in the same way that Blue Water damaged uh, a number of shop shops in um, southeast London and Kent. But investment is going to go up, they're putting a lot of money into the business to help it turn around, and they're targeting a 400 million pound profit by 2025. And the fact that 40% of profits will be from outside retail, that's in financial services, a big ramp up in financial services, but also they're planning to build 10,000 homes for rent in the next few years, which is an interesting concept because it's the first time John Lewis has really gone outside retail and finance in any big way. Although, Speedon had great ideas in the 1930s before the war ruined them. Speedon, had, Speedon intended to start a hotel chain. Having bought Waitrose, he thought, ah, I can furnish a hotel from department stores. I can provision it 
from Waitrose, and it's a wonderful synergy of the two. Unfortunately, no such thing happened because, the park, because of the war and the partnership was starved of money after the war. And I've also just noticed this, the, pan, the pandemic, well, not this one, this following slide I've noticed. Um, one, of his, one of the key things that Sharon White did was went back to Sweden, to Sweden's writings and figured out, recapitulated what he was motivated by. And uh, he was very strongly motivated by making sure that everybody in the business and in the community the business served was looked after as much as possible. He he's essentially started a, uh, a health service, uh, not a health service, I mean, a, um, uh, what, am I, what am I striving for? Uh, a, he, he produced his own beverage report in about 1930, 31 and started introducing some of the things that beverage encouraged. Welfare state is the expression I'm looking for. It's a, a partnership welfare state in the 30s. <clears throat> and a number of these initiatives here were started or, or joined by um, by the partnership in the second half of 2020, as a consequence of which, which magazine named Waitrose Supermarket of the Year because of its COVID response. John Lewis stayed number one brand in the UK according to YouGov survey. And Greenpeace made Waitrose best for removing single-use plastics, which isn't saying much probably because there's still a huge amount to be done in removing single-use plastics. And no, then there was this. And I understand from chatting to Neil beforehand that the U3A is trying to make itself more diverse with some difficulty, as I can well imagine from North London U3A, I, we had one Asian woman as a member of our 700 member group as that I can recall seeing, and I expect you have the same. So it has a diversity and inclusion plan set up starting this autumn which begins with equal parental play and leave for 26 weeks. Um, pregnancy loss support. So they're supporting people who've had, who've miscarried, mothers who've miscarried, and the partnership's got a very good counseling service already. They're going to extend a flexible working option. When I was um, IT director of Waitrose in the very early days, I encouraged uh, people, um, I had, 50% uh, of my programmers and analysts were women. And when they had children, I wanted them to stay. So um, I pioneered uh, against a, a lot of opposition, uh, programmers and analysts working from home. Uh, so they would come in perhaps once a week and work from home two or three, or come in even just once a month. In fact, one couple relocated to the Scottish islands and were still employed by us part-time. And that was very, very, uh, efficient use of, of experience because they they you know they've been with you for seven years they learn a hell of a lot, lot uh, about your systems you don't want them to disappear and start again so the partnership has a lot of flexible working always has had a lot of, also a lot of part-time working so the partnership is not going to insist that everybody comes back to the shop except of course you've got to have people in the department store but in back office jobs you don't need to have that uh, one thing they want to do is to improve the career prospects of people who set themselves into part-time working. They had a, uh, during 2020, they had a, um, a series of uh, debates within the business, encouraging people at the bottom to, to say what, what would help them um, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, they started a pilot scheme to help young people leaving the care system into retail because there are a lot of people who, who have just worn out by the care system and by the NHS. And this is very interesting when I picked up part of an ultimate one, supporting ethnic minorities by reverse mentoring. In other words, if you're a top manager or directory, John Lewis or Waitrose, you get mentored by a, somebody from an ethnic minority, typically a black, an experienced black shop assistant, um, in how to deal properly with ethnic minorities. Now that may seem a bit alarming and a bit, I hate this word woke, which seems to have come in to some of you, but that's what they're going to do. And I have to say, I applaud it. And I think Sharon White has been a magnificent uh, choice as chairman, just at the right time. She was given a, a real hospital pass, had pandemic arise within a month of her arrival. 
and she had to deal with it and she has done. So the business plan looks, looks, of course, optimistic, it has to be, but it looks good, assuming we can all get back uh, to the way we were by the beginning of, by, well, by October, the 90% you know, of the profit of a department store comes in the last three months of the year. So Christmas is actually crucial. And there we are. Thank you for listening. And um, questions and observations. I shall leave that up for a moment, uh, pointing, pointing out that I've got copies of the book available. Um, um, stop share, right. Uh, and I'll get, if anybody's interested, I'll give Neil that information so I can send it on to you. Thank you very much, Peter. I think we'll all give a, a silent clap, please, to Peter for that wonderful presentation. Maggie, do you want to take, take it forward from here? Uh, yeah, I haven't got any questions at the moment, except one I've got. I couldn't understand the photo you gave me of the non-existent John Lewis in 1956, because we definitely shopped there before we had my first child, which was in 1958. And we might not have started till 57, so I'm a bit puzzled by that. Well, uh, I have memories of... Well, perhaps I've got it wrong. Uh, you're, you were there, I wasn't. I was in, I was in Croydon. I was, yeah, I, was, cool. I was walking, I was walking like John Betjeman's um, uncle, unwilling to, well, probably less unwilling to him uh, than him, like Snail to Whitgift, uh, not Dulwich, um, I had the option and <laughs> chose Wicked because it was closer. Um, so I wasn't up there. Um, what, what I can tell you is that it fully opened in 1960. Uh, I think probably it was open by 1958, if you say so. I mean, certainly it didn't start rebuilding until 1955 and it took a long time to rebuild it. But I, I defer, I defer to, your, to your local knowledge, Maggie. Well, I've still, I've still got a big ledger that we have with all our expenses in, including our twenty pounds a quarter mortgage. <laughs> Bravo! Uh, there's Bravo. some, there's someone. Sue Bradman has a question. Yes, hi. A uh, question for Peter. Very interesting talk. Uh, <clears throat> what will happen to the slogan "Never knowingly undersold"? Because uh, I understand that's now being debated. <laughs> You're quite right, it is. It's been debated. It's been debated for the last 10 or 15 years. <laughs> the moment the internet arrived, uh, it, 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 it was called into question because um, the problem with John Lewis is that it provides uh, products. L let's, let's, take a, let's take this computer I'm sitting on. I get, I get two years guarantee for free. Now, um, that doesn't happen elsewhere. And when you have comparison sites, they're, in they're inclined to compare only the headline price. Now, John Lewis has, been keep, has, has subtly changed it never, knowing, from never knowing he undersold uh, to something like, uh, it's got a, sub, a subtitle which talks about uh, value. My, our take on it, um, me, and, me and my um, ex-colleagues who, who meet from time to time has been, it's, it's been, it is unsustainable in its present form and I think it's going, it's going to be dropped, which is a great shame actually because even though it's difficult to understand when you first hear it, it's, it's, it's memorable for, for its three words. It's probably yes. the shortest sentence Speedon ever wrote because he wrote very, very long sentences. <laughs> in, in, so I, th I think it's going to have to go, but the principle will remain. Uh, we've got to be competitive on value, service, and, and we've got to be honest. Could, could I say, I say we... that in the early so I was there, in the early days, if you bought, for instance, a washing machine and found it cheaper somewhere else, and you had all the receipts, you went back to John Lewis, and they gave you the money back if theirs had been more expensive. I don't know if they still do that. Uh, they still they still do that. Um, yeah. If if it's bought in a shop, uh, yeah. I think not if it's bought online. Um, in my day, there was a department called Intelligence, and whose job was to go to, to go around and check all the prices. And what's more, a number of shop assistants in John Lewis Oxford Street, for example, would go out in their lunch hour and find things that were cheaper, 
and they'd report them and they'd get a bonus for reporting. Them. So in a sense, it was it, was a, it cost the partnership a double hit, but it was worth it because people trusted it as you clearly did. Is it Mike Marriott has a question? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, yes, yes. super talk. Can't Congrats. see you, we can hear you. Oh, all right. Okay, all right, super talk. Anyway, um, it was just to say um, about the delivery service for Waitrose, yes. which I understand was, was sort of external, Locado, whereas all the other supermarkets did it themselves. And I just ah. wonder if you have any idea why they... Yeah. Why oh, they oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes. I was, on the, I was on the Waitrose board, Mike, when, we, when uh, all this conundrum came up. Now, I'll, I'll go back a bit. Um, when, when the idea of home shopping for food came up, it was quite clear. You're muted, Peter. I'll unmute myself. Right, I'll start again. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the question, Mike. Um, I was there on the on the waitress board when this was debated very early on. Uh, the conundrum is that um, there is no justification financially for it. You're going to lose money hand over fist. But you got muted again. I got muted again. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to. I'm going to keep finish with hand over fist. It says the host. Uh, it keeps saying the host is muting me. So I don't know which host is both muting me. But anyway, I'll It'll keep be Neil. going. First of all, then, uh, for the business, it's unprofitable. Not least because uh, what people tend to want, what tended to want, was to deliver the big items like toilet rolls and washing powder, which have got a very low markup, don't make much money for you, but they wanted to come in themselves, this was in the early days, to, to, to select their own fruit and veg, which, is what, which has got a high profit margin. So quite clearly, you were going to lose a lot of money. But if Tesco starts it, and they take your best customers, because the best Waitrose customers were those who had more money than time, and if Tesco took them away, then you'd lose your best customers. So we had to do it as a defensive move. So we started what is now called Waitrose.com. Uh, and my department, my IT department that I was running, uh, we, we, we put that together uh, very early on. And then along came four whiz kids from Goldman Sachs, who were negotiating with Marks and Spencer to start this business, which they ultimately called Ricardo. But they, they got... The, uh, Marks and Spencer's people got cold feet, so they came to Waitrose. As a consequence of which, we had, we invested, John Lewis invested a huge enough sum of money in Ocado, which like Amazon, lost money for a long time until Ocado floated. And then uh, the, uh, the partnership got its money back and more, fortunately, because it had transferred the money to the pension fund. So there was I about, <laughs> about 10 years ago thinking, Oh, I hope my pension's not at risk. It was never at risk, actually. But, but the, the, the answer was, we, there were always two strands, a, a, an Ocado strand, uh, which was done from a, a warehouse, a big, a very, very big um, uh, computerized warehouse in Hemel Hempstead, and uh, the Waitrose.com offer, which was done from the shop itself. Now, five years ago, a bit less, um, Ocado started to negotiate with Marks and Spencer to replace Waitrose, and they have done so. So Waitrose ramped up uh, Waitrose.com. Um, they, they rebuilt the website several times, and it and it's it was the fastest. It started from a lower base, but it was the fastest growing online shopping site in uh, Britain. It, it multiplied its trade by four times last year, and, and it built a. Um, a a center, a distribution center in Enfield. So when I was, doubtless some of you, when I was, uh, in fact, I was quarantined because I, I, I came back from France, I was quarantined for a fortnight. I got my waitress deliveries from Enfield instead of going to Finchley and myself off the shelf. 
That's a long answer to a simple question, Mike. Apologies for that. There's another one from Sue, Sue Batman. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you think that JLP have in mind to become a Peabody or Guinness Trust through the development of build to rent properties? Do you see this sector of the business growing to the detriment of retail? I don't see it growing to the detriment of retail. The problem is that re uh, um, Bricks Retail is in, is in deep trouble. Uh, as I'm, as I'm sure, um, every report coming out in this this year and the following year will 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 conclude. Not least because the rents aren't coming down, and the rents are crippling. I mean, if you if you go to you know John Lewis is in Brent Cross, John Lewis and Waitrose are in Brent Cross, and they're the anchor stores at one end at each end of Brent Cross shopping centre. Um, they and they pay substantial rents. Apple incidentally came to um, Brent Cross and they put themselves there and they don't pay rent. They refuse to pay rent. And they said to Hammersons who own it, look, you need us more than we need you. We're not gonna pay rent. Part of, part of the rent incidentally is, is, um, is paid on uh, profit. So there's a complicated arrangement, there. but this shows you the power of the big tech companies. And it's quite clear to me that uh, if, if John Lewis, is if the John Lewis partnership has got more than 50% of its in, of its profit from retail in the next 10 years, uh, I'll be very surprised. It's, it's got to diversify. And we've seen a, a number of them go under. I don't think it'll be expensive if, if, if it's retail offer because it's retail offer online is extremely good, I think. Yeah. Um, but, but Amazon gets in everywhere. It infiltrates everything. So at, in Bread Cross Shopping Center now, Amazon have a shop purely for a click and, click and connect. They've got no merchandise in there at all. Uh, the, uh, to sell no merchandise. It's just a, um, a, a place for you to pick up your orders. Thank you. Are there, are there any more questions? Yeah, I'd, be, I'd be interesting to know if any of you have worked for John Lewis. Because normally when I give this talk, I find two or three who have actually worked for John Lewis. In fact, in one talk, I found somebody who start, had started working for John Lewis in 1946 at the age of 14, oh. amazingly. And we had a, quite a lively debate. She started in Pratt's Stratton, funnily enough. I worked for the competitors. I spent 20 years with House of Fraser and we were always looking oh. over our shoulders to see what John Lewis were doing to see what their prices were, to see what the selection was, because in the buying side, that was the that was the most important thing. We had to watch you every minute of the day, and we were in and out of your stores like anything. Can I, can I ask you a question, Peter? Sure. Um, the department stores is all about theatre, or has been all about theatre, making, making it attractive. The latest thing in Oxford Street is the Marble Arch Mountain that they've built there. What's your opinion on it? Have you seen it? And what's your opinion of it? I confess I haven't seen it. Have you seen it? I passed it, yes. Has, has anybody been there can describe it to me? <clears throat> it's a great green hill with trees and, and bushes and plants. And I believe you have to pay if you want to get to the top of it. It's, um, it's, it seems to me to be totally ill-conceived, but the idea is that you, you, could be, you could look down Oxford Street um, from from the top of it. Oh, how exciting! He said <laughs> <laughs> sarcastically. Uh, th th there's a lot. There's a lot of um, of talking, John, about about that, that point of theatre. Um, and I think actually what they're doing is consultancy. They're 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 having that the they had a um, what was it? They had a a, a very a very a massive zoom. Uh, a, a beauty advice. They had some beauty specialists in, and they're doing lots more on um, on dress for for, um, for people to come in and consult about what's suitable for what dress that's suitable suitable for them, or something like fashion fashion advice. I, I'm expressing myself poorly, but but other things. They're they're looking at that kind of personal service to get some people into the shop. The danger is people coming. 
Oh, sorry. He said, there's someone called Barbara who says, Robert worked for John Lewis in Oxford Street for 30 years. I don't Barbara. know who Barbara is, I'm afraid. Tell me, where did you work, Barbara? Hi. Your husband. My husband, oh. he's here. No, I, I, I'm under the suit and I'm, I'm hiding behind Barbara's name because I can't work the computer. But, oh. um, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, go on. Sorry, just putting video on. Yes. Tell us, pseudo Barbara. Okay, I, I worked in Oxford Street from um, 68 uh, and survived 25 years till sadly made redundant. Oh uh, dear. Not the, not the partnership's greatest skill in making people redundant. Um, but, but looking back on retail in the late 60s, early 70s, working on the shop floor, um, from somebody who was basically fairly hopeless at school. Um, it was a magical experience. I cannot believe, um, well, you, I cannot believe, you go into China and Glass now and you could nearly have a game of football um, due to lack of customers or staff. Um, when, I, when I worked in the basement, China and Glass, that department had 60 people, 60 members of staff, yeah, yeah. And they were absolutely at the top of their game. You could say to um, uh, Mrs. Parkinson, uh, you know, does this China pattern come with a soup coupe or a soup cup? What's the difference? Who knows? But she would know. She would know whether it's going to be deleted in the next 10 years. The knowledge skills of those people were absolutely extraordinary. And dare I say it, I think some of that inherent skill is now maybe on its way out. I'm sure you're right. A lot of that knowledge has been sucked, as it were, into the computer system. Yes. So you, 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 they have to go and look at a computer to find out. And, yes. and because they can do that, they tend not to have the knowledge. You will find two or three people in any, in any department, usually, if you're lucky, you'll find there will be somebody who knows all. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I, I can attest to that from, from my experience in John, mostly John knows Frank Cross or John knows on Oxford Street. You, you joined the partnership in the same year as me. And, yeah, I, yeah. and I started actually working above the shop in John knows Oxford Street. We had a small group of programmers up there. Um, so I remember walking through the shop and marveling at it. Yeah. Uh, your, 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 yours, in, in Peter Jones, the China and Glass Department was known as the Fairy Grotto. Yeah. For reasons yeah. that you probably are aware of. <laughs> of course, yes, yeah. Well, it it, it was it, it was basically the characters, you know, that the, the the departments that the department manager of gifts was the great grandson of Blondini, the chap who did the tightrope walk across the Niagara Falls. You know, it it was just full of the, the the weird and wonderful and entertaining. And you know, you worked hard and you played hard. And I think the other thing is that the the buyers were the top of their game. Of, of getting things into the stores. And this is before, once again, a, a, maybe a cheap shot, that the partnership seems to be now um, very brand and name conscious. So you can buy a, a Levi pair of jeans in John Lewis. Well, so what, you could buy a pair of Levi jeans anywhere. Um, yes, I, the, I, think it's following, I think it's following the fashion. I, don't, I, think, I think it's stuck with that. Yeah, and part of part of the problem is is um, that it, it's extremely difficult to maintain a very wide as you knew as you know very difficult to maintain an extremely wide assortment, mm. and and they've had to shrink it and shrink it and shrink it. Um, it it's diff, it's difficult. The other the other is the ratio of of uh, of um, staff costs, yeah, which, which has gone up and up and up. Uh, you were paid a pittance. Uh, now you're paid now they're paid perhaps a pittance and a half. Mm. Well, I, I, I will tell you, my my uh, first wage packet was eight pounds a week. Right. I'm trying to think what I got as a programmer, 1,200 a year. So I was getting 24 pounds a week. Well, there you go. You see, I, I was I was at the coal front. I was down the coal mine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, it was great. It, you know, I would not uh, change a moment of it. It was, you know, I ended up by being... Uh, one of the managers in an obscure part of the partnership that was deemed to be non-profitable. Um, Which was that? Can I ask? It was it was John Lewis Contracts. Oh, contracts. Yeah. Did you yeah. did you last the twenty five years to get your long leave? Uh, 
don't get people me started. People listening to this may not may not know that if you if you survive in the partnership for twenty five years, you get six months holiday <coughs> on full pay. Yeah, just 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 one observation, if I may, that the sure. partnership is or was riddled by rules. And one of the rules was that if you were made redundant, you could not have recompense for loss of your uh, sabbatical. So I was made redundant and I couldn't have my sabbatical. Just before 25 years then? No, I had my 25 years. I was in 25 years, but and, I didn't oh, get it. And you did, so you didn't take it and you lost it because you haven't taken it? Correct. Ah, I see. What a stinker. Yeah, absolutely right. But anyway, hey ho, you know, as somebody says, you know, um, always forgive your enemies, but, but but never forget their names. But anyway, it's, it's, it's... <laughs> but on that high note from someone who really loved working there, I'd just like to say thank you for a fascinating afternoon, Peter. So thank you yeah, well, all very much.